the boss says I should start. Okay, so I wanted to uh, pick up where we were last time, and what we were discussing was the computational type theory and how it relates to formalisms, and I want to use that as a motivation and jumping off point for my last lecture on Saturday uh, that will uh, we'll emerge from what I want to say today. So we'll, we'll see what that's about. Okay, so last time I, I wanted, uh, this will be relevant today, I wanted to call attention to a simple fact, which is, I mean, it's, it's so elementary, it's just worth, but I just want to see it stated, and I'll try to leave it on this board so I can refer to it in a minute, which was I asked you to verify the idea that equality, I mean, it ought to be, is the least reflexive relation, okay, on A, okay. And one way to, to say that is to, uh, it's a characteristic pattern, is this kind of universal property. So it sort of says, if you want, like sometimes if it's the first time you've seen this kind of thing, you could just suppress the C for a moment and, and then it's just a matter of providing the evidence for the reflexivity. So we're basically saying C is a reflexive relation, ignoring the third part. You put the star in there because that's the witness to the fact that A is equal to A. So you can have that or not. Uh, I, have, I wanna have it there for, a reason that will emerge. So the idea is you say, if C is a reflexive relation, so there's a proof for any A and A, because we're talking about relations over A, there's a proof for any, any element of A that C holds of A and A, and then star I, I put in there as the witness to that fact. So, so C is reflexive, and I have a proof of, of, of inequality between M1 and M2, then uh, in fact, C will hold for M1, M2, and M for that particular proof. That's the reason for having the M in there. So that's the whole idea, and that's the, the whole statement. And the witness to C holding on that, so in other words, it's kind of saying, well, if equality holds, then C holds, because equality is the least reflexive thing, so you can map out of it into anything else that happens to be reflexive. That's the way, one way to think about this. Okay, and so then the, the idea is that the witness to it is you just do a substitution. You just plug in P with M for A. Because the reason is, is that we know that the definition of the equality type, sort of semantically, uh, is uh, we know that the definition of this means that M is going to be equal to star in EQA, M1, M2, because that's how we defined it. And moreover, because of that, M1 will be equal to M2 and A. But now we have two equations, M is star and M1 is equal to M2, and C has a functional dependency on two elements of A and evidence for their equality. So because of the meaning of this being a functional dependency, it respects equality. So I'm going to know in particular that C of M1, M2, and M, if you don't mind me just writing it, you know, just abbreviating like that, that's going to be exactly equal to C of, uh, what do we write here? Uh, let's say M1, I think I chose M1, yeah, M1, M1 star because M1 is equal to itself, M, uh, M1 is equal to M2, that's what we have here. Because M1 equals M2, you could say flip it around and do transitivity, so M1 is equal to itself, and M is equal to star, so I can put those in, and C is a family that has that functional dependency. And then moreover, I can plug M1 in here, so we know that P with M1, uh, actually would have been convenient to write it, uh, uh, this is M1, so I can write P of M1, if I plug that in, is in fact inhabits that type. So how about if I write it there, okay? Inhabits that type because I can instantiate the A to M1, M1, and then I get star here. P with M1 is that, but this type is equal to that, so I get the thing that I want. So it's completely, you wonder why I even bother to say it, but I guess that'll come out in a few minutes, okay? So that's what I, I gave, I said, well, formulate and show that, the, that equality is the least reflexive relation. Okay, so that's one thing you can do that's kind of going to be important. There's, I wish I could slide this. In the other room, I could slide that board up. So how about if I try over here? The other, like, really basic fact is, uh, is that the, the only element, or you can say, yeah, the only element of an equality type of, well, let's say of EQ, A, whatever it might be, MN here, is uh, star. In other words, what we say is, 
if you know that M is in the equality. So this is really kind of direct from the from the uh, the definition. Excuse me, if it's not, uh, correct from the from the from the definition. Oh, excuse me. Uh, let me write this M1 and M2 so I don't. Uh, make a mess here. Okay, so we do that because we know that if this is the case, then it has to be equal to star. So I was kind of using this over here, so I wanted to make this in the same, in the same type. We know that. So in particular, the kind of iterated equality type has an element. This is inhabited. I have stars actually in the iterated equality type because if I look in an equality type and I have M1 and M2 and I have something which is in it, it's going to be equal to star. Okay, so it might take a moment if you're not used to it, right? So I'm, say, I'm stating an equation about elements of this equality type, and I'm stating it internally, meaning that the equality type is inhabited. And that's, of course, true because when it's true, when, the judge, when it's judgmentally the case, then, of course, this is inhabited by star. So again, it's like maybe a little mysterious why I'm saying this. Okay, but it's called a uniqueness of identity proofs or equality proofs. So I'll call it uniqueness, or sometimes I prefer unicity. I, I, don't, know, I don't know which is like the better way to say it. Uniqueness of whoops, equality proofs or quality evidence or whatever you'd like to say. Okay, as I mentioned, people use the word proof kind of loosely and it means lots of different things. Okay, so the elements of the equality type. So, from a semantic point of view, uh, the type theory knows that all there is is this trivial witness to reflexivity, okay? Uh, uh, Guys, I'm gonna exploit not knowing this in a minute, okay? But that's what I'm, what I'm going to, what, where I'm heading. Okay, so I'm just recording at the moment two painfully obvious, perhaps, facts about the, the semantics that I set up for type theory, and I wanted to then riff on that. So then, last time then, what we were talking about is we were examining, okay, we we're examining formalisms, if you want to say it, sort of abstract implementations or bases for implementations, okay, that's a, a I'll just put that in quotes, a phrase I just made up on the spot, okay, for, you know, type, for the for the type theory. So we're looking at these things. And we, we recall that the idea is that these are going to always have the, uh, are always inductively defined by a bunch of rules. And for deriving various forms of judgments. And then I wanted to say uh, judgments, okay, uh, of the form, okay the following forms. Okay, so I'm re re this is a recap from last time. So it's usual in these formalisms to distinguish type checking from what is called, we mentioned, definitional equality. I kind of write that one first because I sort of feel like it's the primary one, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we can write it like this, where the ones on this side we were called definitional equivalences or it could be, you could say, calculational if you want. Nobody ever says that, but anyway, you could say that. <laughs> calculational, if that's even a word, but you could call it calculational equivalence. Equivalence by virtue of calculation. So as an example to remind us of what we would do if we had, uh, for example, if we have a term, uh, oh yeah, and the, uh, let me mention on the side, and. A possible criterion is that these be decidable, but I'll get to that in a minute. So right now we will have, for example, we might have a term like this, and let's write that. This is just, would be, I'm um, thinking familiar to you, at least an outline. Okay, so we would do this. We would have something like that. Okay, as M is in A2, that would be a typical rule for the introduction. There's often a type label here, and the reason for that is to help for example, often people want to have the satisfy the criterion that if you tell me what the variables types are and you give me a term, I can read off a type. I can read off in some sense, a type may not be not unique because I can calculate on the type and simplify it in various ways, but anyway, you can give a, a default or 
inferable, synthesizable type for a term. And in order to do that very often, not always, but very often, the thing to do is to put a type label there. So let me just do that, because you, you do. I kind of want to mention that because it has to do with what's called extraction and erasure. And I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, OK, so and then there's the usual kind of application rule. OK. Uh, OK, let me try to write this in some form where the numbers seem to line up a little bit. So you'd write the usual application rule like this. And you'd have, oh, let's just call it A. And then I'd plug in M2 for A. OK, so that would be, so that's a typical thing that you've, you've seen before, I hope, uh, that you've written down. And, and then the thing I wanted to mention, when we speak in terms of calculation, we always expect that we have at least the following kind of fact. So what do we mean by calculation? Well, it's all what are generally known as the beta-like rules. Whether we have more than that is always like a question of debate, OK? But I feel this is not, not really debatable, OK? That you really, you really ought to have, so let's call that, I don't know, A1 before. So if I have uh, with A and A1 and M and A2 and N and A1, OK? It might have been nicer if I wrote M1 and M2 here. OK, so let's do that. M1 and this, uh, M2. OK, so then it'll be M1 with, with uh, M2 for A and A2. One second. No, that didn't uh, work out very well. But anyway, OK, let's do it like that. I hope I wrote that right. OK, so the point is, is that you get a beta-like rule. So beta rule, the beta rule, you might call that, for, uh, for the, uh, the arrow type. OK, the dependent form of the arrow type. So that's what I mean by calculation. So we'll always have these kind of calculations. And there's always a bit of a question as to what other ones you would have. So for example, with pairing, uh, let me not, see, it's already, uh, anyway, let me start cheating a little bit and not writing out all of the derivation information because it has to be there, but it's a good, it gets a little bit uh, tedious. OK, but the idea would be that you would have that. So these, I would say, you for sure have. And maybe you have something like this. And the reason for the maybe, so these are the beta-like rules, and this is the eta-like rules. So the reason for the maybe is, well, it all depends on what, if you, it all depends on this criterion, so the various criteria that come up. So one, and these are not like absolutely indefeasible, but these are common criteria for formalism. So one thing you can do is you can have decidability. And there's going to be meaning, like, for example, a type checking is decidable. And there's, it's a very anodyne thing. And it would be nice if that were true. But as we've mentioned, and I'll come back to, it's not always the case. But we might want to have decidability, and, which means, in particular, I have to be able to decide definition equivalence. And I, it's not something I'm going to develop here. In previous instances of the summer school, I've gone through proofs of things like that. And they're really quite fascinating. Everyone should go through them. But anyway, not, not this time. OK, so we could ask for decidability. And then rules like this tend to complicate matters. Plus, I will say, without elaborating, when I get to other types, like sums, for example, it becomes more and more unclear exactly which rules I ought to have. And let me just leave it at that. The problem is how to deal with induction and, and inductive reasoning. And we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll just leave that aside for the time being. The other thing is a kind of computational adequacy, which I'll explain in a minute. Or it's usually called a computational, it's usually called canonicity. Unfortunately, people mean lots of things by canonicity, but I will, I will mention this. Because that's going to be, uh, the, that's the, the jumping off point. That uh, This is my rhetorical device. I'm going to use that as a jumping off point. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm working this way. So we're going to emphasize that. OK, so my point is, is you have this thing, and you might want to have these various criteria. And then the principle that I was suggesting to you, so we can kind of keep that in mind. And then I, I, the principle that I was suggesting to you is the following basic fact, OK? So the idea is, from the point of view that I'm taking in these lectures, is that the formalism, I don't know, I'm, uh, 
I could write just because it's only because of my particular presentational strategy, is just a means of deriving truth. In fact, I could put that as another criterion, uh, truth, okay? And in this case, about programs, about computations. Or another way of saying it is, that's one thing that I, that I could say, or a related idea is this idea of, I mentioned last time, props as types. This combination of this is that proofs or derivations, formal proofs, that word, you keep tripping over the word. So I mean proof terms, uh, proofs, formal proofs, derivations, that's what I mean, okay, as programs. And it also comes under the rubric of what is called extraction or code extraction. And the way you do that is you, first of all, define, and in this, at the stage we are at this moment, it's very elementary, you define a notion of erasure, erasure uh, of, of formal terms or formal proofs, which, and uh, all of them, the types and the terms types, the whole thing, okay, like this, which I'll write like absolute value sign seems like a nice notation. And the idea would be, I'm getting rid of the stuff I don't need runtime. So for example, if I want to run this code, I certainly, if I, I, I keep on not wanting to use X, okay, for some reason that comes up. Okay, so I might define it like that. It's quite trivial in this point, but you just sort of say, well, erase all this extraneous type information that's presumably there only to satisfy the first criteria that it be decidable, okay? So that's what you do. However, there can be other things. So it could be, I will say, more or less trivial, okay? That's what I, what I will do. It could be more or less trivial. In other words, that's the most trivial thing, is just erasing uh, irrelevant uh, type decorations because the operational semantics, the execution model, doesn't require that information in order to run. So that would be your first cut. There are other things one will do, which I'll explain momentarily. And then you prove, which goes under various terminology depending on how, from what side of the mountain you get to this spot. It's sometimes called the fundamental theorem or it's called the soundness property or something like this, so I can just call it soundness, which says, well, we go through all of the various forms. But I'll just write down the key one, which says that if, a, let's say, a typing judgment is formally derivable, then it had better be true modulo the erasure for some notion of erasure. So whenever we state this kind of soundness, it's with respect to some idea of erasure or program extraction. Okay, and it's also demanded that what you do here have the property that M1, that these come out to be equal. That thing, if things are convertible, sometimes people say definitionally equal, calculationally, whatever terminology we make, this is some kind of evidence-free immediate simplifications of the kind of beta reductions. I want to say that whatever you decide you're going to do here, and what you do and don't do is often guided by decidability considerations. And anyway, it better turn out that those are true equations. And the same thing will happen now also with the types, because you, you basically have to do everything, you know, so, and so you, ha you have to do this. So that would have to be a type. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that should say epsilon. And that really means self-equal, that means self-equal. And simply what we do here. Okay, so that's like a basic criterion. And we're going to riff on this particular notion uh, in a little while, but that's the, that's, that's the plan, okay? So for the type theory, I, of course, I haven't written everything down. I, I am asking for a bit, of, uh, a bit of indulgence in that it's impossible for me to write everything. So I'm just trying to give you a flavor. So, oh, okay, question back there, yep. I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to define some notion of erasure. Let's say for this moment, 
all I care about is I'm going to get rid of type labels, let's say. Because lots of things. In a formalism, for example, with sums, you can't really get away with writing 1.m if you expect to be able to read the type off of every term, because you don't know what the other, even if you know that this has type A, this is going to be A plus what? So then officially it becomes quite dreary. It's in A, B, you know, in 1, A, B, M, and you have to have that. But then quite likely I'm going to erase that to just 1.m because that's all I need at runtime. Okay, so that's like a most basic, there are more fancy things, but this is like the most basic thing. Okay, so all I'm trying to do here is, especially at this stage, the formalisms, you know, look very close to the, to the semantics, but in reality, one can get, things can get more and more divergent in various ways that are interesting in some cases and uninteresting in other cases. This is kind of uninteresting, but it has to be dealt with. Okay, so, all right, so the, now let me uh, pick up my, my, my thread. Uh, what was I, uh, what was I saying? Okay, so, uh, the, so the issue is, okay, we're expecting this to be the case. So this is our, our basic soundness criterion. And as I mentioned, when you think of yourself as starting with a formalism and proving properties about it, uh, Rick Statman, I believe it is, the, the theorem, okay? And in fact, it said of logical relation would be the way, I'm pretty sure the way Rick uh, named it a long time ago. And I mentioned to you this idea of having type index member relations, that what equality means is determined by the type. One terminology for that idea of having it be determined by the type is called logical relations. So uh, let's not worry about why. It's like all sorts of terminology. It carries baggage that maybe isn't so relevant anymore. I don't know what. Okay. So, uh, but I, I could do it. Here I could call them, <laughs> it just occurred to me right now. I could call them typical relations, but you wouldn't like it if I did that. Okay. So uh, I don't mean exemplary. I mean pretend, determined by type. <laughs> yes. What? Oh, yeah. What do you mean by erasure on a type? Well, remember in the first lecture I was emphasizing that in a dependent type system you have to mix types and terms. So I can have a type uh, that has all sorts of terms in it that presumably need erasure. Okay. So uh, and so you know that, that I'm going to erase. So if I had a lambda inside there, I might get rid of the type label. You know that would that would happen inside of a type expression. You know, for example, I could have a sequence of length, some complicated piece of code that has type nat, and that complicated piece of code is a term, and I would erase that term. So that's what I mean. Okay, in other words, I'm not erasing the types entirely because I have this setup in which the types are programs too, and they have meaning, and I have to worry about that. So it's not like I'm another possibility of erasure. I, now that I, I just only thought of it right now by, by virtue of your question. Uh, well, another thing that people do consider is just forget about the types entirely. So I don't want to do this because, oh, right, because I, uh, I want to get a result out of this, okay, which is the following one. So that's where I, where I was. So there was another question before I state this, okay. So what's the, a corollary of this and why I'm doing it the way I am? It all sort of fits together. So a corollary of this is that if you have a closed term of type Boolean, then it evaluates to true or it evaluates to false. Well, why is that? Let's say I prove this theorem. I'm not going to go through such a thing with you. I was, the reason I proved the various lemmas I did about the type constructors, I only stated a few at the board, but in the notes I gave you, for example, they're in there. The particular lemmas I chose were the ones I need to prove this theorem. Okay, that's what I was doing. That, that's why I said, oh, let's try to prove that if M is in A or B and N is in A, then MN is in B. And then I proved other such things. Well, because I had in mind that I was going to go by induction on the derivations and I was going to prove this theorem. So I proved all the right lemmas. The, the principle of it is, with all the time in the world, I would have proved all the right, right lemmas and then this would be, would be uh, plain. So I'm just asking you to accept that I can prove this because I proved all the right lemmas about the computational meaning of types. So if I do that, then you see, if I have a closed term, so the emphasis here is 
the gamma is missing, right? So this is closed. Then it must evaluate to true or false. Okay, good. So that's, and then a particular corollary of that, which has been emphasized, is a kind of logical consistency because I don't end up with being able to, I couldn't possibly prove M, uh, that true is equal to false syntactically because if I were to do that, uh, I would violate this kind of criterion. So I know that these are going to evaluate to either true or false. So what did I, what did I mean by that? Oh, and then they would be equal in, uh, they would be equal in the meaning of bool, which contains only true and false. Okay, and equality is the reflexive relation. Okay, so, uh, so we can do that. So that's a, a, a basic kind of setup. So from this point of view, uh, the whole point of a proof theory is just to provide you access to the truth. Now, it's true that people study proof theories and try to show that they have various properties. Here is another property which I call the canonicity property, which is another sort of desirable property is this. So the soundness criterion, okay, soundness tells us that you can do program extraction that are proof, you know, from proofs, that proofs have a computational content. Okay, that is they can be interpreted as programs. That's what I'm kind of outlining here. And an important other criterion, which I wrote on the obscured upper right board up there, which I, I just thought of as canonicity, is I would like to internalize this fact, okay, is that we would like to internalize this, to internalize this fact, internalize computation as definitional equivalence. So in particular, we would like to have, and this becomes a, a criterion that people apply, no such criteria, I think, are indefeasible. There are reasons to want it and that are defensible, but maybe you could argue against them. So let me not, okay, but this is certainly a very common thing, which says that in particular, if I can prove syntactically as M is bool, that's kind of what I was saying before, I know, oh, I, did I write it? I'm sorry here, what I should have done, I forgot my erasure maps. I just got through talking about them and then I forgot to write them, sorry. Just a brain cloud. Okay, so I mean when you compile it down, okay, the compiled form is true or false. I'd like to be able to do that calculation in the definitional equality because the definitional equality is supposed to represent all of the reduction steps that are possible. And so if, I, if it really does, then I could anticipate that I can derive that M is definitionally equal to true or it's definitionally equal to false. And this is a separate theorem. You really have to prove this requires a lot of work, okay? So this is a separate theorem. The basic result is due to Martin Luff probably as long ago as 1972, okay, or 75, somewhere along in there before you were born <laughs> uh, for various values of you. Uh, so the, uh, so the, the uh, uh, it's a non-trivial thing. In other words, I'm saying it doesn't follow immediately from this at all. Okay, it's not, not, I'm going to show you in a moment a situation where we have that computational interpretation, but this is not the case. That's kind of where I'm heading, okay? So, so that's, uh, that's what I want to mention. So that's a separate theorem. So what is this? Is it's a kind of internal completeness property, okay, I would call it, a kind of completeness property. And what I mean by that is that if you feel that the formalism, the purpose of it is it's my implementation, this is what I'm working with, never mind what's true, I have to have an access to the truth, then you might like it to be internally complete that if I have a closed Boolean in particular, I should be able to calculate what it is, I have it to be true or false. And believe it or not, it can turn out that this is not the case. Okay, good, so I will, I will mention this. Okay, so that's the basic setup. And in fact, this will be true uh, even uh, for a large chunk of type theory, including, and then this is why one of the things I left off last time, is how do you express equality? Never mind this definitional equality. The idea is how to express, or I should say formalize, okay? How to formalize equality. And there's a formalize 
equality, now I mean equality, not just calculation. Okay, so for example, I might like to know, this is going to be relevant for me momentarily, I might like to know that for any A and that I might be able to, I would like to know in some form, as, oh, uh, well, it, it is true in, in, the, in the type theory that something like in the underlying computational type theory, that A plus A would be equal to two times A for some obvious definition, okay, of plus and cross that involves, you know, it can be done with primitive recursion. This would be the case. And in fact, it would also be the case that they would be equal as functions within the type theory. And the question is, oh, I should have said how to formalize. Okay, so how to formalize, how to formalize that equality. So how do we define it? So last time we talked about two methods. So one, which I think has a hell of a lot to recommend it, <laughs> but let me just explain my storyline, was what I called ETT, okay, which has this notion of equality reflection, and as was mentioned on, on uh, as was mentioned on the Slack, okay, it also specifies what is called uniqueness of equality proofs. Okay, and, and one can do this. And the only issue with this is it has a lot of virtues, uh, many virtues, and it's expressive. It gives you a nice way of reasoning about equality, but maybe you don't care, but it's not gonna be decidable, okay, for anything sufficiently rich that we have around, but you will not be able to decide type checking. So one trade-off is to say, if all I care about is the thing is it provides access to the truth, any port in a storm, do whatever the hell you want. Okay. Implementation, do what you like. As long as it gives me true things, I'm good. Okay. I think this is a defensible position. Okay. All right. So that's a version uh, that, in particular, Andre is exploring right now in this general direction, and it'd be worthwhile to see how that all works out. Okay. The other thing is what is often called kind of ITT, which is originally Martin Luff's original formulism, and it uses a, uh, a different method. And I, I could describe it, I'm not sure, I can't speak for anyone else's mindset, but you might say, if I'm going to maintain decidability, you start to scrape for what sort of things I'm going to do to internalize equality. And what it does is it formalizes, and I'll explain now in a second with reference to that board over there. So it formalizes, I'm going to use a different terminology because you'll see why in a minute. It formalizes what is called identity as the least reflexive relation, or it tries to. It all depends what you mean by reflexive. <laughs> and so, uh, so that's the thing. So you'll notice I said to you that equality in the computational type theory is the least reflexive relation. And indeed, this is an example, I originally write dots there. Uh, the, the, this is kind of an example of reflexivity. You're saying, well, this thing is equal to, equal to itself. It means those are the same thing. Okay. And uh, we're going to see what happens when we try to do it in a formalism because it kind of famously doesn't work. Okay. So on the other hand, the weakness will turn out to be a strength, which will turn out to be a weakness. So that's the way I, where, this is, where this is going to go. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll tell you about that. Okay, so first I just have to formulate that the last time I, I didn't get quite enough. Uh, I didn't, write, didn't get time to write down what I wanted to write down. So let me do this. So some of you may have, uh, may have seen this before. It's a kind of a nice example of the issues I mentioned about erasure when you look at it. So the idea is that uh, if it'll let me be uh, sketchy uh, to some degree, but because I don't want to be awfully tedious here. So it has this a type id m1, m2, and I could write down definitional equivalence rules, but forgive me and I'll just be kind of brief about this. Uh, uh, if you have two terms type A, I'm going to have a type which is going to be called id. The upshot of what I'm going to say is up, to the, up through what I'm going to do, it can be safely interpreted as equality. But then people are going to do things, and then that's where I, where I want to get to. Okay. So, all right. So we have that guy. It starts to look a lot like equality. So you say, well, if I have M as in A, for example, then, and now it has to do with the 
the criteria, what form, what criteria, the upper right corner somewhere criteria, what criteria formalism should satisfy. In order to satisfy some of these criteria, people are quite explicit about these things. So it's often they'll say, reflexivity in type A at M is going to be, specify this as a reflexive relation. Okay, so that's the way, the way to think about that. So it's almost like writing star colon that, except that you have that. And indeed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase all that and just make it star, but we'll, we'll get to there. Okay, now there's going to be a certain similarity to what I wrote here, so that's why I did it. So now the way you express that it's the least reflexive relation is basically the same mindset that I gave you before, so that was kind of a warm-up exercise, okay? So what I'm going to do is uh, I can write this in various order, but I have, if I have my A, B, and A, it's, a lot of it's very, very kind of similar, except I have now id here. I'm using a different terminology for reasons that, partly because that's what one does in the literature, but also I have a reason to be careful. Okay, so let me, let me do that. So uh, this would be id a, b, and I will derive from this some capital C as a type, okay? So I, as we did over there, what I'm gonna work out is that, uh, oh, and you give me some particular proof, let's call it p, id a, m, n, let's call it that, so this will be M and P. So again, if you like, suppress that in your first cut at it and just say, I've got a binary relation and I'm gonna demand that the binary relation be reflexive. So I have a proof Q uh, that the binary relation in question holds for A, A and reflexivity. Again, if it's your first time looking at it, just like suppress that part. And so I'm just saying C has to be reflexive. So if C is a binary relation, you know, just momentarily, C is a binary relation that happens to be reflexive, then I can turn any proof of identity into a proof that it holds for M and N. Okay, that's intuition. So the way this is always written is this horribly intimidating looking thing called J. But I, I hope in the way I just pronounced it out to you, it seems less intimidating. And the idea is if I take this guy, and again, I will use blackboard uh, liberties and kind of cut to the chase here and just write down the definitional equivalence, then this would be Q with M for A, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so we would do it like that. Okay, we're at the appropriate types. Now, in, a, in the setting of formalism, there's a lot of particulars that you have to adhere to, but let me, let me just be a little bit hand wavy. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea there. So that's the usual definition, okay? The, the usual definition. So it sort of says identity is the least reflexive relation, because if you give me any other reflexive relation, then there's this blah, which maps from the identity into that relation. Because it is the idea. Okay, so, so it's a, a universal characterization of equality, you might say. The problem is it's not exactly what you might think at first blush. Because there's an important theorem. Let me make sure I have, oh, oh uh, I'm trying to think of what order I should say the next things. Uh, if you give me a moment. Okay, so let, let me do it like this. So now I'll have, I'll, I will revisit soundness. And the key idea is this, as I've already mentioned. Identity of A can be interpreted as equality. And I'll just put all my erasure bars in there. I'm doing that, probably I should like use different colors. And in the notes I handed you, I did very laborious. One of the reasons I couldn't get them done in time for summer school as I was laboriously working on the color. But anyway, I use colors and stuff, and it might be a little more visually better on paper if you look there. So I don't know what I wrote here. Sorry, get rid of that. I can interpret this as equality. And then the critical idea is, if I'm pushing through, so I do that, and I just say, therefore, reflexivity at M, oh, I don't know, that's just star. I just interpret it like that. And then J is the interpretation of J, well, let me not re replicate all this, is just the erasure of the M in question. Okay, so this is a proof of M and N, so let's say the erasure of M. Oh, excuse me. 
It's just the erasure of Q, I called it, and I plug in the erasure of M for A. Because you see, that's what I did here. Did I, did I do it right? Yeah, that's what I did here. Except that I kind of stupidly used the letters in a slightly different way. Oh, that's irritating. Uh, forgive me, this is the Q in question. Sorry, I could have made my letters right. If I change them in place, um, I'm asking for trouble, but let's try it. So we'll put Q here, and then that'll be my Q, and then I'll call this guy P instead, because that's what I did over here. And then we'll call this P, and then instead of M1 and M2, I call them M and N. So let's do that so that it lines up. And then it's M, N, and P. Oh, that worked out OK. All right, so I hope that that's right. OK, and then the argument then changes accordingly, alpha variant accordingly. Uh, well, let me not repeat it. Uh, let's just leave it in place, the argument. You'll have to update that. OK, but it's the same argument. OK, so the point is, is that under erasure, because equality is the least reflexive relation, I can interpret the least reflexive relation as the least reflexive relation. OK, that's what I'm doing, except that it doesn't go the other way around, OK? And so that's the, that's the important thing. So what this means is, and then we'll see, is that I'll call this formalism IPT has a computational meaning. We knew this, but I'm explaining to you what it is. And then I will, I'm going to explain to you how we get into a little bit of trouble with that. OK, so good. Uh, where are you looking? Oh, I just mean that now at the blackboard. Define the erasure to mean equals def. So, it, but at what level is, is it equals? I mean, I was, say, I was saying to you there are loads of notions of equality. I've got triple bar, equal dot, equal def. I've got uh, things flying all over the place. Right, but this uh, one is, is which, which equality is this? Because I'm proving a theorem for you about the formalism. Right, so Which is the soundness theorem. So now that's just in the math of ordinary life. Right. We have a okay. Yeah. So I'm not claiming this is internalized in some log in some particular formal logic. Okay. So I just want to say it has a nice computational meaning, but there's a theorem of Martin Love, essentially the one that I quoted above from '72, tells us it is the case that for A and that, you can find a proof term which says that in NAT, A plus A is 2 times A. You can find that proof term. It's a recursor that goes by induction on A. Okay, That is the case. This is not really what Martin Luff told us. I'm instantiating it. Okay, So this is the case. However, so this is the case, but what is not the case is that they're equal as functions. Now, what do I mean by it's not the case that they're equal as functions? I have to be careful about that. OK. There is no element of this type. OK. You cannot have an element of this type. The reason is that the theorem of Martin Love says if you have closed terms, so I'm having here all closed terms, if once I get down to here, if I have two closed terms, an inhabitant of the identity type implies that they're definitionally equal, equal by just plain calculation. And these are completely irreducible. There's nothing, there's no way to manipulate one, one of these things into each other. These are not definitionally equal. Now, how do I prove that? That has to do with the way you usually buy an algorithm for definitional equivalence, which I'm suppressing here. And then you can use that algorithm to prove for sure that there, there's no way to show them definitionally equivalent. You can't just eyeball it unless you know a result like that. So just trust me here, OK? They're not definitionally equivalent. That's hard to prove, but it, it, I hope it's kind of obvious. It's not by virtue of some simple calculation replacing 1 plus 1 to 2 or doing beta reduction. That's nothing to do. OK, and indeed, you won't be able to show they're definitionally equivalent. So this is called the failure of function extensionality. And it's kind of famous, OK, because, OK. Even though, by the way, under interpretation, that is, if I interpret these down into the type theory, interpret that as equality, oh, then that, well, those will be equal. I, I mentioned that 
somewhere else that's got obscured right now. Okay, I mentioned that earlier. So it's true, but it's not provable in the formalism. It's a relevant incompleteness in the sense that you could very well care about this, okay, and, uh, and it's not something you can prove in that formalism. So this is a sort of famous thing, and now it leads to the, the next idea, which is kind of important, okay, which got mentioned on Slack, and so it's kind of one of the reasons I decided to speak about this today is because a discussion came up on Slack. Oh, we're in the business of, oh, that's exactly where the information I just quoted, I'm erasing, sorry. Okay, so I, I've forgotten where it was. Okay, so now, uh, good. Uh, so what to do about this? I, I don't want to go through all possibilities because lots of things have been explored, but a common solution, which has, which is, has in common with another thing that's coming up. Common approach is to add a new, add an axiom. And if you know anything about type theory and the computational meaning, there's at least something to worry about here that I broached on the right-hand board. Okay, so common approach is to add an axiom. It's always called fun x, pretty much. And what it does is it gives you a new form of identity proof. You say, well, if for any A and A1, you can give me a proof that, let's call it, you know, I'll, I'll write it out, apply M to A is the same as apply N to A, which is the case here for the <coughs> example I gave. Apply both of these to A and B to reduce, then I will demand that fact, which will be, which I will have. So if I have this information, I, that I write it down, this should be maybe A2, right? Okay, so if that's the case, then id a, 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 a one arrow A2, MN will be inhabited by that. So in other words, what, what is often written is fun x of H will be a term of type id A, A1 arrow A2 of M and N in this particular case, where H uh, satisfies the premise. It's the, uh, the hypothesis or the premise that they, the functions are, one could say, extensionally equal. I'm pretty sure the, 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 H is, the letter H is often chosen for a reason, but I'll, I guess I won't, I won't get to there, so, so never mind. Okay, so, the, uh, so that's the idea. And somebody mentioned that like Lean does this for you automatically or is capable of doing it. Anyway, lots of people do this. You, now you need to ask yourself, there are two things to ask here. One is, now wait a minute. What do you mean, the whole way type theory works is this matching of intro and elim. What does it mean to add an axiom? Suppose I, I say, oh, you know what? I'll add an axiom called infinity to the natural numbers, and I'll just postulate infinity colon that. What? That is inductively defined. I have a recursor. It's going to work on zero successor. What is this random infinity symbol you're throwing at me? It doesn't make sense to add axioms to type theory in a certain way, except for an important fact, okay, which is the following thing. So my first point is that weakness is strength. Or let's call it the strength in weakness. <laughs> There's a strength in weakness. Maybe that's the way I can put it, which inspires in the end, inspired lots of things. And I'm quoting a result by Hoffman and Streicher, which is very famous. And I will sadly remark, uh, Martin Hoffman died prematurely in an accident uh, last winter. Uh, really terrible, brilliant man. And I'm mentioning one of his brilliant results. Bad thing. Okay. Shit happens. I don't know what to do. Okay, so uh, strength and weakness. The idea is that this kind of thing, ITT, cannot uh, prove, if you will, internally, that there's only one identification. A 
in other words, element of an identity proof, I call them sometimes identification. That is, you cannot, because you might think, well, I'm adding this axiom, maybe I can prove, like here, that anything that's in there is equal to star, and then I, therefore fun x would have to be equal to star, and that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's completely insane. But the thing is, it can't do it, okay? And this is a, uh, a, a very clever thing. I, I'll just call it by name, and I won't explain it well. Uh, I won't explain to you what it is, but you can kind of look it up. It's something called a groupoid model. A groupoid can be thought of as an equivalence relation with evidence. You can think of it as a generalized group, but it's kind of the same idea. Okay, so this id type is a binary relation with evidence, and by the way, you can prove that it's an equivalence relation. I just didn't do that. So they interpret it as a groupoid, which is an equivalence relation with evidence. I'm waving my hands a little bit. And by showing that, they show that you cannot refute this. So it's not so bad, okay? It's not, doesn't become, so semantically, in some sense, it's okay. So this is kind of, so to say, it's sort of okay mathematically to do this because you're not going to get into a horrible mess. However, it, but it ruins canonicity. So if you care about computation, it's a bit worrisome. And the reason is, it's a little bit what I alluded to before about infinity. If I take an instance of, I take J, it knows about reflexivity. But what is poor J supposed to do with an instance of fun x? You're given an instance of fun x, and that's supposed to be what? I don't know, it's like adding infinity to a natural number, and then the recursor, blah, 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 applied to infinity is supposed to do what? I don't know, okay, you're the one who added the axiom, you tell me. Okay, so the axiom got added, but it's not clear how to handle it computationally, except there's something even more suspicious. I'll get you in a minute, William, okay, yet, it's valid under erasure. In other words, it's sound computationally because I can simply erase fun x. I call the fun f e here. I will just make that b star. Why? Because in the setup of the computational semantics, which has meaning in terms of execution behavior programs, function extensionality is completely true. Function, the very definition of what it is to be a function means it takes equals to equals. Okay, it's extensional. So I can just, er just blow that away, just like I don't care about it. So the programs in this setup run without difficulty, but you cannot, it seems, the question is how would you recover from this? And I'm not gonna be able to speak about that, but the route to the recovery is via what I'm gonna talk about next, so that's why I bring this up. Okay, so it's not clear what you do here. This is basically a stuck program. It's like saying recursor, oh, I inconveniently erased it. It's like saying recursor applied to infinity. It's stuck, okay? And well-timed programs aren't supposed to get stuck. Okay, I'm, I'm you know, joking, really, but there's, a, you know, there's something weird going on here. Okay, all right. However, it's okay because I can interpret it into the computational type theory using this notion of erasure, and then everything's hunky-dory and we're good. Nothing else to say. But the formalism, if you're stuck with the formalism and you're trying to prove something, you're, you're, you're gonna get into trouble because a corollary of this being a mess is not every term of type Boolean is, is equal to true or false. You can't internalize the computational content inside the, inside the theory. There's a, a sort of a kind of incompleteness phenomenon that's going on there. Something, something looks a little bit wrong. But at least it can be interpreted uh, you know, semantically and even computationally in, in, this, in this manner. Okay, let me uh, check my notes to see what I... Uh, uh, yes, Henry, there are. Uh, I put them on Slack. Uh, however, they're woefully incomplete. I tried to get uh, stuff done before I came here, but I wasn't able to do it. Okay, yeah, good. 
Okay, so, so the issue is there's strength and weakness, but it's nevertheless pretty weak. Okay, we get into a situation that we, we ruin canonicity. Okay, and so that's kind of a problem. And so one thing, so in this particular situation, there is a way out using a formalism called OTT. And some of you may know this, this is by um, uh, uh, Alton Kirk uh, and uh, McBride. And they have formulated this, which is a proof theory that, uh, uh, now we know how to explain that proof theory in a clean way, and it's via what are called cubicle methods, which is what I'm going to approach next, okay? So that's what I'm, what I'm going to do. Okay, so there is something called OTT, which can do it, but we now know better methods, but to get to them, it's better to go a slightly different route. Okay, so that's the state of affairs with, with function extensionality. If you don't care about canonicity, then I guess, you know, all right, no, you don't have to care. And if you don't care, then this is not a problem. However, if you think that you ought to have a property that like every closed Boolean is definitionally equal true or false, then that's not going to be, that's not going to be the case when you throw in fun X. So it, and it all depends on what you're doing, okay? It all depends on what you're doing. But you can extract code from it, so it doesn't, it doesn't disrupt compiling things down to programs, but it disrupts the way in which you use the formalism uh, itself because you don't get that. Okay, so that's the state of affairs. All right, so this idea, though, about there being strength and weakness, what's going on is that because the formalism is merely this RE thing, it's the old story of axiomatics. If you've ever studied first order logic, right, you know that despite all your efforts in first order logic, you can't pin down the natural numbers. They're weak, okay? And there are, for example, interpretations in which you actually have an infinite natural number and things like this, okay? So the weakness can be exploited by saying, well, you see, it doesn't know that there's only one identification in contrast to the semantic framework I set up. Then, since it doesn't know that, uh, I can take advantage of it. And then, once you realize that, then you can really go to town. Okay, because then people started saying, well, in for a nickel, in for a dollar. Okay, let's, uh, let's start doing other things. Okay, so uh, uh, the, I was going to say the next thing, I, I'm not trying to give a chronology, but in some sense the next thing that uh, came up was uh, what is indeed a brilliant idea of Vladimir's, which we've spent a few years we collectively, a whole bunch of people, principally, if I may say, Thierry Kokan's group at, in Sweden and also mine at Carnegie Mellon, have worked uh, very hard to find computational meaning for. So what I'm going to, I'm just going to briefly, briefly summarize this. I cannot go into great detail. Next time I'll say a little more in the context of uh, the computational meaning of this idea. So. So another idea that came, that came up, which is along similar lines. Why is it along similar lines? Uh, it's called uh, uh, univalence, or just univalence. And, you know, I feel like I just realized, probably all of you know, this was proposed by Vladimir Vavatsky, who's quite a, uh, quite a distinguished, to say the least, mathematician who proposed this, uh, who unfortunately died a year ago. I don't know, everybody involved in this subject is dead. I should like take a hint, maybe you too. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Vladimir also died tragically in an accident or a medical accident, a health, health issue. Uh, and uh, well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so uh, but it was proposed uh, by Vyvoski. And it has been tremendously influential and continues to be, particularly in some parts of mathematics that people are very intrigued by his, by his ideas. And, uh, and it, I can say it's along similar lines because it tries to, what is happening with function extensionality is you're trying to make up for a deficiency. There aren't enough equality proofs, okay? Oh yeah, I just thought of a, point I need to make, I'll make it as I go along. Okay, so there aren't enough equality proofs. The claim is there aren't enough equality proofs. Uh, 
So here I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because this can get rather technical. But a motivation is the following thing. It is common to, at least informally, do what is called identify structures of various kinds up to isomorphism or things of this nature. Okay. People will often say somewhere in the first paragraph or in a footnote or somewhere, oh, we just identify all the groups up to isomorphism, or we identify all these various structures that you're considering up to isomorphism. So just to be concrete about it, a particular example is I want to not much care about the difference between A cross B and B cross A. Okay, it's a kind of, it would be convenient sometimes in certain situations to just not worry about such thing. This isn't the most dramatically motivating example, but it's nice and simple for board purposes. There's lots of other things I could do. I mean, many, many, many other things. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, yeah, l let me not go there. But there, one can develop, and people have studied uh, quite extensively, uh, the Italian fellow whose name I'm not thinking of at the moment, studied isomorphisms of types quite extensively. Uh, his name will pop into my mind in a moment. Uh, 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 but let's say we want to do this. Because there's this function swap, what is swap? Well, guess what? It swaps the components of the pair, which is its own inverse. So it's a bijection. And in fact, assuming we have the various eta principle, it's a bijection on the nose with definitional equivalence. But at the very least, we can expect that round trip is equal as an inhabitant in the identity type to, uh, as, uh, to the round trip, to doing swap composed with swap. So, so it's going to be a bijection. That's the idea. That should be intuitive. So I'm going to send the pair AB to the pair BA and backward. And so you could say I can identify these. So what does it mean to identify? to identify them. Well, the first cut, it, it does take a lot of development to do this right. So I just want to motivate it. OK, so let me flag that I'm not doing this right. In previous lectures here, I've gone through a lot of this in detail, but you can look it up. OK, so the, the Vladimir's idea was to add an axiom. And the axiom is called the univalence axiom, so let's write it UA. And here I'm. Like, I'm suppressing lots of things. But let me just, let me just give it to you. I'll, I can put this in quotes. But just basically take UA of swap, and you say, this is an identification of A and B, provided you have a type of types called the universe. So this is called the universe. What is a universe? It's a type of types. I don't care any, uh, a type of types. In other words, the elements of U are themselves types. We can talk at length about universes, but all I care about it for the moment is that it's a type of types, and A and B are in it. That's the premise. And if you have, oh, I'm sorry, this should have said, I, I didn't write the right thing. I was trying to write this. I, I meant to say, that's what I meant to write. Sorry about that. So in other words, for the, for the A and B, I can write it like that. OK? So that's the idea. All right, so I wrote it here with A and B being generic. But if I write specific choices of A and B, then there can be many, many such isomorphisms. OK, uh, if I have, you know, I don't know, if I do sort of bool cross nat, I can consider it, or for that matter, I don't even need to go that far. I can say bool is isomorphic to itself in two ways. One is by the identity, and one is by negation. So there can be two different reasons. So the reason I emphasize this is that the data that goes here, at very least the function, this is the, the data okay, involved. okay. Uh, matters, right? And yet, you're sort of calling them equal, OK? So that's the weird thing. You're going to say that they're equal. So there's UA on this guy, 
okay, should inhabit that type. Now, what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is that using J, then it means that I can consider these two things to be interchangeable in contexts that use them. Okay? In particular, they're interchangeable as types, which basically is meaning whenever I have an element of A cross B, via swap, I can turn it into an element of B cross A at my convenience, whenever I wish to do that, and vice versa, because these types are equal and they're interchangeable. So the, the premise is, is that it is a, is a mechanism for interchangeability. And we're going to stipulate, I guess might be a good word here, we're going to stipulate that, well, equivalent types, and this is, again, I'm, I'm suppressing details here, that equivalence types are identical and therefore interchangeable. So I can call, say this identity is a mechanism for interchangeability, and I'm going to claim, stipulate that equivalent types are identical. So the premise of it is, the reason I want to do this is that I already have machinery around for interchanging that. In other words, I don't want to manually thread swap through my code. You know? I just want to be able to say, well, I specify they're identical. That's why people do this. And then wherever you use one, you can use the other by working with J. But for one thing, this is all well and good. And Vladimir gave a model that is an interpretation that validates it and using what are called a particular combinatorial device called simplicial sets. Let's not worry about that, okay? What that is right now. But the question is, the thing I want to point out about it is that as with function extensionality, it ruins canonicity. Because we, if you'll let me abbreviate J, whatever, of we had a problem with FunX, What is that supposed to be? It's e the situation is even worse with univalence because this will be an equivalence E. And the question, what is that supposed to be? And now the, the point I want to make. So in either case, or both cases, it ruins Canada City. And now the question, which I will begin to address next time. So it ruins canonicity. Now. Function, so let's call this one and two. In case one has a computational meaning, I mentioned that. That has a computational interpretation. So I can sort of say, okay, we need to devise some formalisms that will, you know, bring that out properly, and OTT is one of them. Okay, so we can do this. But case two, the question with case two is what would be a computational interpretation? And what I'm going to do next time is give you the outlines of that by generalizing the framework I set up so far to account for what is, higher, what is called higher dimensional structure. So I'll do a cubicle type theory. I'll give you, I cannot, I've been despairing of how I'm going to pull this off. I'll, I'll give you a flavor. That's what I can do. Okay, so, uh, so what would be a computational interpretation? I will just remark that it ought to exist. I mean, if you just take, okay, if you just take the idea that, like, with swap, I know what to do. Swap is a perfectly good lamb term. I know how to run that. It swaps the components for pair. There's nothing remarkable there. I ought to be able to sprinkle in the swaps wherever I need them because I'm treating them as equal. And I ought to be able to make that work, shouldn't I? Well, you can, but. <laughs> But it's a hell of a story, okay, making all that work. And so the, the answers to this principally are CCHM, first of all, Cohen, Kokan, Huber, Mortberg, okay, which was just published this year, but I think it was around 15, maybe, question mark, but it's actually, for various reasons, it's marked as 18. And then there are uh, various papers by Carlo Angiuli and Favonia, whose actual last name is Hu, H O U. Uh, uh, well, we write it F for Favonia, and H, and you can look at my webpage, and these are 17, 18. Okay, uh, pub, they're being published now, but we're put out an archive last year. And we should look at these. So this is 
you know, Kokan's group, who deserves a tremendous amount of credit for this. There are some ideas that we use that are inspired by him. We take a different approach, but anyway. And, uh, and then this is, uh, this is uh, my group at CMU. So, the, uh, so this is, uh, this is what, uh, what we'll be doing. I'll be talking about that. So the important point, though, is that whereas here I can kind of get out of trouble by this erasure trick, uh, no way I can interpret it as equality anymore because these two types, although you can kind of say they're interchangeable, in the sense of exact equality in the way I described it in the computational type theory, they're not equal. They're not the exact same type. Okay, that, no, that's not the case. Okay, so I have to somehow, so there's no chance of just doing some obvious simple thing, no, like we did here. So we got out of trouble easily here. Here, it took a lot of work, and now the, so I'm trying to bring you guys, the, the next lecture will be GWIZ very much, uh, where you will kind of get a flavor of what's going on, and I'll show you a particular, our particular uh, take on the thing, uh, what are called cubicle methods, in particular what's called Cartesian cubicle methods. And in the process of dealing with that, well, there's lots of stuff to be said there. So I'll say a few things next time, so that's what will happen. Okay, so. This is uh, in the last few years, let's say in round figures, uh, five, six, seven years, I forgot one. Actually, it's about 10 years ago that Vladimir visited CMU. It might have been, uh, I, I have to look it up, eight, eight years ago, something like that. First visited CMU and spoke about this. And uh, uh, it was very obvious that it was a very deep and brilliant idea. But at another level, I thought, uh, completely crazy. You can't add axioms to type theory. And I felt, sort of heartened when Martin Luff stood up in a different meeting and said more or less exactly that. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, I'm not totally nuts. And, and so, but, but the, the point of it is, if you want to bring out the computational meaning of type theory, then it's work. If you only care about the math, if simplicial sets are good for you, okay, I, I have nothing to say to you. Okay, I have no contribution at all. My premise here is what does all mean from the point of view of computer science? That, that's what's going on. And so, uh, so that's what I sort of want to I, I wanna bring up. Okay, so let's, uh, let's stop for today and uh, we'll pick up. I'm, I'm, I'm the last guy on Saturday. I hope you won't be completely asleep or already on a plane. Uh, you might be. Okay, so uh, we'll see what we can do. But it'll be a little bit gee whiz. I have worked out what I would like to do, but I am very cherry about whether I can actually pull it off. So we'll try. I've never tried to give to an uninformed audience any explanation of what we're doing, and I'm afraid of it. So we'll, we'll work together on this on Saturday to figure out uh, whether I can do it. Some of the ideas are pretty appealing and pretty simple, but it does get a little involved, and I don't know really efficient, simple ways to get to the point. So I'll do, I'll do my best. Okay, so we'll try to do that. I've been despairing of whether I can do it, but I'll try. I will bring to bear all of my teaching skills, such as they are, and try to explain those ideas to you. Because if you do dig into them, I think they're pretty cool. You can get really seduced by them. Okay, so that's it. So that's will be enough for today, and uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>